Sweet. John, our 67th lesson tonight, our title, You Are Gods. If this was not something Jesus said, this could be quite a disturbing title. You would say, where in the world is this going? But we're quoting Jesus, who's quoting the Psalms in this title. And it's this tonight will conclude our journey through the 10th chapter of John, where we've been for quite some time. Uh, let's start with just reading a few verses. Uh, get, get our John 10 in front of us. We'll work this a little bit. Go away, come back. Verse 34, Jesus answered them. This is, once again, I say this every week, context, context. This is that long battle, verbal battle, sparring that Jesus has had with, his, with the Pharisees back and forth since the healing of a man born blind. He answered them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods. Now that's the end of the quote. Um, he, he doesn't, he, he, that's all he quotes. We're going to do more than that in a moment. I just want to put out there what Jesus quotes. Three words, you are gods. If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. Nice little parenthetical there. The parenthetical between the parentheses. We can't ignore this. This is in the Bible. That's basically what Jesus is saying. We can't ignore it. Scripture can't be broken. If God said you are gods, then what does he mean? Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? Quotes himself. Quotes the Old Testament. Quotes himself. In between, can't break the Scripture I say to you, I'm the son of God. What do you say to the fact that the Old Testament says you are gods? If God says of you, let's, let's use the proper pronouns here. You're the disciples in this story. If God says of you, you are gods, why are you so mad if I say I'm the son of God? Okay, so you can see what Jesus is doing here. He's elevating what he reads in the Psalms to justify the fact that he's called himself the son of God. Why are you questioning why, why would you consider what I'm saying blasphemy? Let's go look at the source text. It's from Psalms 82. Now what I want to do, Psalms 82 is only eight verses long. That's the entire chapter, by the way. This is eight verses. Our verse is like six. So rather than just reading our verse, a big chunk of which you saw Jesus say in John, let's read the whole chapter because context is important. God stands in the congregation of the mighty, he judges among the gods. Interesting phrase. He judges among the gods. Elohim. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Say, Before I move on, I just want to say, I didn't point that out because I'm trying to open a can of worms about there being gods in the cosmos. But I'm trying to set you up for the literature. And the literature here is that God has positioned himself above all other things. There's a lowercase g on gods. We're not referring to God, Jehovah. We're not referring to Adonai, Creator. Uh, so he judges among the gods. How long will you judge unjustly, show partiality to the wicked? Three. Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Free them from the hand of the wicked. Simple. Imagine singing this, because this is what Israel does with the songbook. So they're singing these lines. And imagine singing these simple commands of what the gods are supposed to be doing. Remember, that's who he's standing among. Standing among the gods going, hey gods, when are you going to defend the poor, do justice to the afflicted, deliver the needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. When are you going to do what you need to be doing? Five. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are unstable. I said, you are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. There's the Jesus phrase from John 10. Jesus is pulling from what we call Psalm 82, 6, where God is the speaker. So that's the evident part. So that's why I want to read the context. God is the speaker. God says you are gods and all of you are children of the most high. Seven, eight. But you shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth for you shall inherit all nations. Verse eight is not God talking. 
quote mark at the end of seven, God's speech ends. God looks at the earth and says, you are gods, but you're going to die like men. And then the psalmist, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all nations. Now go back to John 10, tack on 35, 36, make sure we understand what Jesus is doing. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came and scripture can't be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent to the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. We can see where Jesus pulled this, okay? Psalm 82, 6. All right, next screen. Psalm 82 refers to man as Elohim. You might not have realized that, but the word God, little g, the little g from Psalm 82 is Elohim. Elohim is the word we all use for God. It's the word we translate God. But the translators couldn't bring themselves to capitalize the G in Psalms 82. When God says you are gods, it's the same exact word that is used for the word God. I'm not, I'm not going to give you a theory as to why. Other, I mean, I think we all have the same theory. It's like, I wouldn't do it. I, mean, I wouldn't put a capital G on there. If God says you are gods, I'm not going to put him on, I'm not going to put me on the same level as him, even though in the Hebrew, it's the same word. There's really no difference. It does show you a level of literary respect that the Hebrews had in believing that God is different than man, regardless of what Hebrew word is used. But I want you to consider the fact that Elohim is used. There should be a little shock value to this, I hope. There was a big shock value when Jesus quotes it in John 10. Jesus, they're accusing him of calling himself the son of God. He goes, what's the problem? Didn't God say of you, you are gods? And they all would have known what it was in Hebrew. You are what word? Elohim. That's a big deal. That's a pretty shocking thing to say. And it's a shocking thing to quote. It refers to man as Elohim. That's a name we use for God. But there is an Old Testament precedent to put man in the position of God, I lowercase g there, because none of us consider man on par with God. And I'm not saying that we should. I want to show you what I think is happening here. In regards to his leadership, in regards to his responsibility to those around him. And then I just quoted a little bit for you from our statements from Psalm 82. What are you supposed to be doing? Defending the poor, doing justice, delivering the needy. In other words, you are a God to the people around you. That was, I'm not saying it. God said it in Psalms 82. You are gods, and as gods, you have a certain level of responsibility. And there is this thing in us that when we celebrate our humanity, we tend to celebrate our liberty first. Like one of the great things about being God's children is that we're free, right? Liberty and freedom. Of course, that's a great thing. We, we don't get nearly as excited about one of the great things about being dad's kids is responsibility. I mean, who gets excited about responsibility? You say, you're my children. What does that mean? That means I get your stuff. But it also means you have to take care of that stuff. So in other words, with my liberty to call myself a son comes the responsibility. If these are two halves of the same coin, you could say it this way. If, I'm, if I come out of God then that aspect that makes me human is my liberty. That aspect that makes me godly is my responsibility to defend the poor, do justice, deliver the needy. Why is it in Psalms 82 that when God calls man gods, he gives him a list of responsibilities, not a list of rights? Because if you called man man or son or daughter, you give him a list of rights. Here's what you get. To, here's what you get. You get... All the rights of being my kid. But when you lean into the side that has to take care of something, like the poor or the needy, that's the side where God says, you are gods. I hope I can do a proper job of explaining this. I think that we have emphasized liberty and rights and freedom and should emphasize them. But maybe we've done it at the expense of what is our role on the earth? What's our responsibility on the earth? It's why as free as we are, the Cain and Abel story shows, as free as we are to offer the best we have, we're responsible for our neighbor. We are ultimately 
that brother's keeper. Let's look at some of those precedents. There's an Old Testament precedent to put man in the position of God. I want to make sure that we are on the same page there. Exodus 4. Here's a Moses and Aaron moment. This is where Moses tells God he can't do it. So I can't, I can't lead these people. I'm not good enough. I, I'm not a good speaker. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well. And look, he's also coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth. And I will be your mouth and with his mouth. And I will teach what I will teach you what you shall do. Now watch 16. He shall be your spokesman to the people. He himself shall be as a mouthpiece for you. You shall be to him as God. What is Moses? What's Moses' new role? All right, you don't want to talk, you don't want to do this, you're going to be a leader. I brought you out 40 years in the backside of the desert, preparing you. We spent 40 years preparing you to lead. You don't want to be a leader, but, or you don't want to be a mouthpiece, fine. Aaron's going to be your mouthpiece. But you are going to be as God to him. That doesn't mean Aaron's going to bow down and worship you. It doesn't mean Aaron's going to take your word as gospel. It doesn't mean that Aaron's going to sacrifice lambs at your feet. It does mean that you are responsible for Aaron. Because that's what being a God to Aaron means. I put you in this position. Can you see from the early part of the Bible, God puts man in an elevated position. Do we consider Moses to be God? No. Did Aaron consider Moses to be God? No. But when God wanted to describe Moses' level of responsibility to, the, to Aaron, the word God uses is you're going to be like God to him. Here's another one, Exodus 7. The Lord said to Moses, verse 1, See, I have made you as God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother shall be your prophet. I want to point something out that might seem unnecessary, but I want to say it anyway. It doesn't say you should be as a God to Pharaoh. You shall be as God to Pharaoh. It didn't say you shall be as a God to Aaron. It said you shall be as God, Elohim. You are going to function in a way in which Elohim functions. Think of, it, think of our two examples this way. Just as I am responsible, Moses, for taking you into a promised land, you are responsible for Aaron. You are a God to him. Just as... You listen to what I say. Pharaoh is going to listen to what you say. You are God to him. Psalms 82. You have people in your life who are needy and hurting and wounded. Be a God to them. Psalms 82. You are gods. What's that mean? Does that mean you replace God? No. It means you take on the role and the responsibility on the earth as if it matters to you what happens. Here's the illustration you've probably heard me use before about Noah and the ark, which is why doesn't God just create more animals? You know, he's going to flood the earth. I mean, it was easy to create animals the first time. Is it hard to create animals the second time? I mean... Did it get harder for God? No. What changed? You're on the earth. And you're so special that in the eyes of God, you're there with him. And when it comes to taking care of the earth, he puts the responsibility in the hands of man. So I've said this before. I, you know, If it were me, I think I would have said to God, we could make the boat a lot smaller if we didn't bother with putting all these animals on it. You know, I don't need this big of a boat. Why are we saving animals? You created them the first time, you can create them the second time. Doesn't work that way. Once I put them on the earth and I put you on there with them, you become a God to them. If they're going to survive, you're going to save them. If they die, you kill them. Wow, that's a big responsibility. I don't want that responsibility. Welcome to your role as a human. You're greater than all that other stuff. In that respect, you are gods. Psalms 82. In what respect? Defend the, the, hope, uh, the helpless. Deliver justice. Do the things that God, that 
do the things you expect God to do on the earth, it's God's way of saying you're going to do them on the earth. So when Jesus says, why, why are you, you don't have a problem with, he doesn't say Psalms 82, but let's interject that. You know, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you don't have a problem with Psalms 82 where the father says you are gods. If you don't have a problem with him calling you gods, why do you have a problem with me calling myself the son of God? Well, that's because we've always had an issue with that. Let's go back to the garden. Look at this one from Genesis. The serpent says, this is three. Everybody, man, we know this story front and back. And that's probably why we should spend more time in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Because we know it so good that we don't always know it as good as we think we do, if that makes any sense. Like we've kind of left it there. But there's a lot there. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Catch this phrase right here. You will be like God. This is the serpent's words to Eve. If you'll eat this fruit, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. The serpent doesn't say you'll be God. The serpent says you'll be like God. What's the point? Here's a principle, I think. One of the principles of the story of the fall, and that's a part of what we just read, is the eating of the fruit. That's the start of the fall. One of, the, one of, one of many principles is that when man ate the forbidden fruit, his eyes were opened to how he was like God. He had consciousness of good. He had consciousness of evil. The opening of the eyes in the garden is a, 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 a storybook way of saying, in that moment, you became conscious of the world around you. Your consciousness was born. The animals don't have that. You have that. That happens in the garden. He had consciousness of good and evil, but sight also allowed him to see where he was unlike God which he had been mercifully blinded to before. Before we read that last sentence, I want you to think about that. Before man eats the fruit in the garden, he's blind. What is he blind to? We get stuck here as Bible students because we go, he was blind to the fact that he was naked. Mm. Naked is just a way of saying he needs no covering. Okay, that, that, that's At its elementary part, it is that he has nothing to hide in front of God and his blindness is he's blind to shame because you would be ashamed if you, were, if you went out in public naked. That's the point of that story. It's, it's to shock you as a reader that when you read Genesis and the text tells you they were naked but they didn't care, you, you're supposed to read that and go, oh, that's not possible. How could they be naked and not care? It's because the story's trying to show you that pre-consciousness, pre-eyes open to good and evil, there was nothing to be ashamed of. The eyes being opened, of course the eyes being opened saw the nakedness. It saw what was already there. It became conscious to what was already there. That's the point of the fruit eating. You eat the fruit, you become conscious to what was already there. The problem is, is that now you are conscious to what's there. And now you're forced to do something about it. You're forced to deal with it. You're forced to make decisions between good and evil. And you're, you're woefully equipped to do that easily. It's the lifelong challenge and the lifelong battle. And so in that moment, you realize that you are like God because God can tell the difference in good and evil. But you also realize all the ways you're not like God. And that's the danger of opening your eyes by eating the fruit, is that you realize all the ways you're not like him, all the ways that you wish you were like him, but all the ways that you're not. And I think it's an act of mercy in the creative story that man is blinded. He walks into consciousness and then we've been working, away, working off of that ever since. I, I put a thought in that last sentence to try to bring us into the new covenant. Psalms 82 shows the real state of man. The real state of man is God says, you're gods. How can you not be? Your eyes have been opened to good and evil. You have consciousness just like me. You're, you are in charge of the needy and the hurting. You are Noah. You're supposed to build a boat, take care of those animals. Yes, you're your brother's keeper. Welcome to the world. You're not a dog, you're not a cat, you're not a zebra, you're Elohim. I don't mean you're God of gods. I mean you do what God does. You take care of stuff. 
You recreate yourself in the world and then you take care of it and you're conscious of good and evil and you're aware of your shortcomings and you're aware of your strengths. You have something that nothing else has. No animal has what you have. And God looks at that from, from that vantage point. Psalms says, this is your real state. Here's what you are. Now go do it. Jesus is simply repeating it. In John 10, Jesus is simply bringing back the old Psalms 82 idea of you are gods and he's placing it in front of us. John, however, and I say that realizing that Jesus and John are standing next to each other, but John gives it legs under the new covenant because John doesn't write his book for decades. And when John writes his book, he has all of this knowledge, this generation's worth plus of knowledge about Jesus and the resurrection and all of that. And that, all of that gets squeezed into this gospel account of who Jesus is. And so I think that what John does is he elevates the story of us being like God to something that had not been seen before. We saw it a long time ago in our studies in John 1. Remember this from John 1, 12. As many as received him, this is Jesus, to them, he gave the right, better, better Greek word, I just kind of, right's great, but better Greek word's authority. Um, I don't know why I think it's better, but I do because it's, well, I think it's better because it speaks from a place of strength. If you have rights, you may not be strong. If you have authority, you have something behind your rights. So when he gives you the right or the authority to become children of God to those who believe in his name, it tells us this. This is from the outset of John, that the way John saw Jesus is that if you believed on this man, and that's why I'm writing this book, he'll say in John 20. This is why I'm writing this letter, so that by believing you'll have life in his name. If you believe on him, you'll have the right or the authority to consider yourself one of the sons of God. John is writing on the other side of Paul. And what I mean by that is chronologically, Jesus, the Gospels accounts, Paul's ministry, John writes his letter. John definitely outlives Paul. Whether you agree that John's written after the fall of the temple or not really doesn't matter, but John definitely outlives Paul. So it's naive at best to think that John makes it through his entire ministry uninfluenced by the ministry of Paul. I don't believe that at all. There was no one in, the, in Christendom in the first century not influenced by the ministry of Paul. And so John is definitely influenced by the new covenant message of Paul. He's writing on the other side. He's fully embraced the theology of sonship, which is Paul's bread and butter, by the way, the theology of sonship, out of servanthood, into sonship, out of Judaism, into, into Christianity. Shows a distinction between seeing oneself as, here's the Genesis motif, like God. What did the snake say? You eat that, you'll be like God and seeing oneself as one of the sons of God, two entirely different worlds. You're like him, you can be one of his sons. Paul is brilliant at this. I want to break down a moment in Paul's ministry tonight where Paul does this. I, I, I really worked with this for months and months ago. Um, and I was trying to wrap my head around how Paul preached. What did he do that made him so good? Um, he's anointed. He's smart. He makes great connections. He pulls things out no one ever thought to write down before. He elevates the covenant of Abraham over the covenant of Moses. That was daring in a Jewish world. Um, I still can't put my finger on it of what made Paul, because Paul's a, a different character. When you get really honest about the character of Paul, there's, there's some areas there that, that are interesting at best. But um, I want a CD. I want a, I want a video. I want to hear and see him. I want to know what did he do that made him what he was because he's this awesome minister to the Gentiles. One of the closest moments we have is Paul takes his theology of resurrection, which was a theology that got Paul in a lot of trouble. I'm about to dip into this in the DDP because we're getting really close to 1 Corinthians 15 on our daily podcast. And that's where Paul really ratchets up the teaching on resurrection, and, uh, which was a, one of the most controversial teachings in the first 
century because that was the fight between Sadducees and Pharisees. Is there, is there a resurrection? And Christianity gets based on the fact that here come these Jews saying, well, I don't care what you believe about resurrection or not. Our Jesus resurrected. So as far as we're concerned, moot point about whether resurrection is real. So Paul comes along and teaches it. And it's a fascinating look because the Jewish concept of resurrection may be a little different than the Christian concept. Like if I asked you what's resurrection, you might go, well, that's where dead people live again. And the first century Jew might have said something else. Like here, here's an example. This is from the Gospels. Herod cuts John the Baptist's head off. His head is physically detached from his body when they bury him, right? Herod hears about Jesus and goes, is that John the Baptist come back from the dead? Which is an amazing statement because Herod knows what John looks like Herod detached his head from his body before he put him in the tomb. And yet when he sees Jesus, he goes, is that, is that maybe the same guy I, whose head I cut off? That doesn't even compute in our understanding of resurrection. You know, how could he mess that up? I mean, he knows what Herod looks like. His head wasn't even on his body. I mean, you can go, well, heads could be reattached to bodies. But you know who John is. I mean, he stood in front of you. How are you getting confused about it? Well, maybe it's because their idea of resurrection had more to do with the spirit man keeps living after the body dies than it had to do with bodies coming out of the tomb. Now, does that discount Jesus coming out of the tomb? Well, no. They look in the tomb and the body is gone. What they believed is that Jesus was alive. And Jesus says to them, Go ahead, touch my nail scar. He pulls the robe open and says, hey, Thomas, put your hand right here where they stuck the spear in my side. Why does he do that? Because of that idea that, well, it's probably not, it's probably just a ghost at best. It's probably not an actual body. So Jesus says, no, I want you to know that I, I have come back. I have resurrected him in a way that is beyond your concept of resurrection. Your concept of resurrection is a Maybe, this, maybe people can live on in the spirit. I'm coming back in a way that you can't possibly understand. And so that is still controversial today as to what resurrection looks like. It was straight bonkers in the first century to a Gentile. Straight bonker. If you walked in to a room full of Gentiles and preached that, you were done. Paul tries it at Athens. When he goes into Athens and there's statue, 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 statue. And Paul goes, oh, you got a statue to the unknown God. Let me tell you about him. Pretty good place to start as a guest speaker. I mean, you're using their props and their culture, and you're going to minister your God into their culture. And so Paul goes to work on, and he doesn't preach the cross. He doesn't preach a crucified Jesus. He preaches a resurrected Jesus, which really butts up against some ideas. But look at what happens on the way, you know, the, the whole funny thing happened on the way to the forum. Look at the book of Acts 17, 26. He has made, this is Paul preaching about that unknown God statue you guys have. Let me tell you about that God. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times, and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. There are two things that pop out at me in that, in that screen. One from the first verse and one from the second verse that seem, they're easy to miss because we're in the 21st century. But if you rewind to the first century to a bunch of Gentile Greeks, and here's this Jewish guy who claims he's got a resurrected Messiah, and he does a couple of things that are pretty amazing. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth. There's Paul's initial statement that everybody is the same. That's a toughie because that's not a real Jewish concept, by the way, that everybody's the same. A Jewish concept is not everybody's the same. We're the chosen people of God. 
Paul goes, God made us all from one blood, everybody that, that dwells on the face of the earth. And then this last phrase, so that all of them should seek the Lord in the hope they might grow for him and find him. Though he's not far from each one of us, each one of us, 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 Jewish, Paul, Gentile, Athenian, Athenian. What's that mean? God's no farther away from you than he is from me. That's pretty big because that's not how a good Jew talks to a bunch of Greeks standing in the middle of Athens. And Paul goes, what we really are all doing, and this is, this is, this is pretty big for a guy who's intelligent and knows Torah to go so that we might grope for him in the dark. All we've ever really been doing is, we would call this grasping at straws. Paul goes, all we've been, we're all from one blood. All we've ever really been doing is grasping at God so that he's not, very, he's not far away from each one of us, 28. For in him we live, fourth word of the 28th verse is big. Not in him I live, and boy, wouldn't you Greeks like to. Don't worry, because when I get to the end of the sermon, I'm going to give you a chance to meet Jesus. No. He goes, in him, we all live, move, have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, and then he quotes a Greek poet. For we are also his offspring. And he doesn't stop right here and go, that's a stupid idea, by the way. You're not all his offspring. You're a bunch of Gentiles. I'm his offspring because I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And I got circumcised when I was eight days old. And I can trace my lineage all the way back to Abraham. And I'm of the original blood on the earth. Every single thing Paul has said in these three verses is opposite of everything we would expect. God made one man on the earth, one blood. We're all sort of groping around in the dark trying to find him. He's not that far away from each one of us. In him, all of us live and, meet, live and move and breathe and have our being. Even your own poet said you're his offspring. You know what? That's not a bad idea. It's not that you're not his offspring. In fact, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. I only put this scripture up here because I wanted you to see Paul's theology is we're all God's offspring. We're all from one blood. In him we all live and move and have our being. We're all, this is who we are. No death, no difference between an Athenian Greek and a Jewish man, Saul of Tarsus. So are people right when they say we're all the children of God? Paul said we're all the offspring of God. So what's the difference? I think the difference is for those who believe on his name, he hath given themselves the authority to call themselves the sons of God. There's a difference in being the offspring of God and being the sons of God. Let's take it back to Genesis. There's a difference in being like God and knowing that you are one with God. The snake said to Eve, if you eat this, you'll be like God. He's not wrong, but you'll realize where you're unlike God. And every sinner on the earth has that same thing. They're groping in the dark, trying to figure out the places where they're not like God. But Jesus came so that you could have life in his name and what does Jesus say in John 14? I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. You want to know God as dad? You want to know him as your father? How are you going to do that? Through Jesus. So the difference is we have a world tonight full of the offspring of God. You've never met a human being that's not the offspring of God. You've never met a man, woman, boy, or girl that's not an offshoot of the character of God. But you've met most of the people in your life that you've met have no concept of what it means to be one of his sons or his daughters because that's a new covenant concept. That you get through Christ. That you get by understanding your sonship. I've been thinking about this. I was wrestling with this idea this afternoon. It's not just this idea. That I think what we've done is we've taken sonship and we've made it into this, this concept that we're trying to mentally ascend to. If I could just realize that I'm a son, it's almost like jumping up this cliff that we can't quite top. <clears throat> Instead of living from posture of being a son, 
we're, we're almost trying to talk ourselves into being sons. And there's a difference in talking yourself into being a son and realizing you are one. You know, talking yourself into being one of the daughters of God and being one of the daughters of God, living as if you're one of them. Um, if all you can do is talk yourself into it, it's not much different than an unbeliever. You know, they can talk themselves into principally living better, talk themselves into a better life, confess my way into something. Rather than living from a place of, um, realizing that you have, and this goes back to what we were talking about last week, realizing that you have an inheritance and what it is and then living out of it. Not just trying to convince yourself you're a, one of his kids, but living as if it's, it, it is something. Not just being like God, but realizing that you are on par with who he is because he gives to you what he is. I think Paul had a revelation very early in the New Testament. I'm de and this, this is a bigger revelation than I ever really gave it credit for. Um, I think he had a revelation. Everybody's the offspring of God. We all came from him, one blood. We all, we're all his. We're groping in the dark trying to find him. I don't know what we're doing. You, you guys building statues. This one's to the unknown God. That one's to the sun. That one's to the water. That one's to the sky. There's the God of war. There's the God of love. Oh, let me show you about this God. The truth is, is you've been looking for him through all of these statues, and you're just groping in the dark because you can't find him. But we're all really the same. The difference, the only difference is, and then Paul ends his sermon with the resurrection. He's going, I believe that he raised from the dead so that we could have life in his name. And what happens is we get to come into his family through a resurrection reality, and they laugh him to scorn. And they don't laugh at him because he said they're the offspring of God. They don't laugh because they're groping in the dark. They don't laugh because they're one blood. They laugh because of the resurrection. That's always been the dividing line, by the way, in Christianity and the rest of the, any other religion in the world. It's not self-sacrifice. It's not giving. It's not going to a temple. It's not trying to do your best. It's resurrection. It's believing that we live a different life than we did when we met him. And it's not, we're just not mentally assenting to that, but we're really living out of it. We're really living out of this different life. And so it's a great revelation to know we are the offspring of God. It's a greater revelation to know I have the authority to call myself one of the sons of God. And so that's the difference to me. I don't have any problem with people saying we're all God's children. And they're a heathen. <laughs> and I go, yeah, you're right. We are all God's children. The difference is we don't all live like it. And we don't all know it. You might just feel yourself as an offspring of God. There's a difference in being the offspring of God and being the son. There's a difference in being a product of creation. And a, think of it this way. This is, a, this is the best way I know to say it. There's a difference in being the product of creation and being the product of new creation. Product of creation, we're all one blood. We're all groping in the dark trying to find him. Product of new creation, to those who believe on his name, he hath given, themselves the, given them the authority to call themselves the sons of God. So you have an authority because of Jesus that nothing else, no one else in the world has. Now, what comes with that authority? Well, that's, that's why Jesus says, why don't you guys have a problem with the statement, you are God's? Because what comes with that authority is you take care of the people around you. What comes with that authority is a great level of responsibility. That's why God looks at you as on par with him, because God holds a great level of responsibility. I was in a hotel the other day and turned the TV on, and it, it, it was right in the middle of that movie with Jim Carrey. Um, I don't remember the name of it. Bruce Almighty. Yeah, where he's, he's God. He meets God, and I, I missed the first part of the movie. I saw it like 20 years ago, and so I kind of forgot how the plot got to where it was. But when I turned it on, he, just, he had just been given the powers to be God, and his, he had just granted every prayer request that came in. And it was because he had an overwhelming amount of prayer came in, and he didn't want to sift through it all. So he just rubber-stamped every prayer. And like... And, I, and absolute chaos ensued. Like the next day, it was hell on earth. There's fighting, there's people killing each other in the streets. Because, and I, I missed why. But there was, I do know that everybody won the lottery. Because everybody had asked the night before, Lord, I need to win the lottery. And so he let everybody win. And so they all, made, they all won like four bucks. <laughs> you know, it's like, because they all won, no one wins. It's like that thing, if everyone wins, no one wins. If everyone's special, no one's special. And so... He, 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 gets, he gets done, 
anyway, he has this, this whole concept. He has this, this reunion with Morgan Freeman, who's God. Good choice for God, by the way, if, just, if nothing else in the voice. Um, and so they have this confrontation. I didn't even, I didn't get to watch the end of it either, uh, but uh, it's been too long since I saw it. I'm not really here to review the movie. I just was struck by this thought as I was watching it of how fun he thought it was going to be to be God until he had to be God and take responsibility. That's what I walked away with. Just went, we love the idea of the liberty of being God. Like, you could be a God over this situation. You could do whatever you want. But part of the experience of humanity is realizing that whatever you are over, like you're, in some respects, you're over your kids like that. Like you're the closest thing they know to God, especially when they're little. Like this is why a lot of us have messed up, a lot of people have messed up versions of God in their head because the God that they saw was mom and dad. And that was bad news in some cases. And so that messed them up with God forever. Because if you've got a dad that strikes first and asks questions later, and a lot of people was raised under that, then that's God to you. So how does God treat your stuff? He just knocks you down. And then as you're pulling yourself up off the floor, he goes, now explain yourself. And that's how we serve God. We go, straighten up, man. Don't mess up because God just knock you down. He'll just ask you later. If he asks you at all, he don't have to. He's God. He can knock you down. So we all, we all kind of have that. Like we're over something. So that it's like the joy of, if I, if I had this absolute power, look at all this liberty I'd have. But the flip side of the coin is the side, uh, that's what I liked about the plot in that movie was that you can't get away from your responsibility if you're God. Can't get away from it. Well, I don't want that. D sorry, that's not the deal. You have to, you have to pay attention. You have to watch out for people. You have to make hard decisions where you say no when, you, when it's easier to just say yes or vice versa. And that's the point of Psalms 82. You're God's. Yay! Wait a minute. Defend people. Serve justice. Take care of problems. Still saying yay? Yeah, we are. That's the church. We're getting away from that. This is why I'm doing this tonight. What disturbs me in, in grace is we're getting away from it. Because the message of grace is so emphasized being his sons and his daughters. That it's not emphasizing the part of us that is like our father. The part that takes responsibility for what we're supposed to take responsibility for. And, and holds ourselves accountable for it. Because that's the part that Jesus is talking about. And that's the part Psalms 82 is talking about. And that's the part I think that, Paul's, that John's talking about when he says, you believe on his name, he gives you the authority to call yourself the sons of God. What I always want people to walk away from from these lessons is to walk away and say, I am one of the sons. I need to start paying attention to what sons are supposed to do. Not just, I need to start paying attention to what sons get to do. There's the difference. What sons and daughters get to do? That's a fun part. Now ask yourself, what do sons and daughters, what are they supposed to do? And if, you're, if your knee jerk is, oh, I don't think we ought to be talking about any oughts, this is grace, then I don't think you understand what it means to be a son or a daughter. Because there's always an ought. There has to be an ought. That's part of being the family of Elohim. You don't get to be part of that family and go, <laughs> to hell with everything else. I just do what I want to do. I'm one of the sons of God. I don't think you realize what family you're in. I don't think you realize how important this is. I don't think you realize what you've been born into. You're not just the offspring. You want to just be the offspring? That's out there. You want to be one of the sons? Welcome to the family. That's a big moment. Let's close the chapter. 1037. If I do not do the works of my father, don't believe me. But if I do, though you don't believe me, believe the works. That's a good statement. I mean, it's simple. It points you to the action. If you can't believe what I say, believe what I do. What I do ought to be proving what I say. I've told you who I am. My works ought to prove who I am. That you may know and believe that the Father is in me and that I am in him. This is Jesus putting himself in equal footing with his Father. 
39, therefore they sought again to seize him, but he escaped out of their hand. It's just not time yet. We're on the way to the cross, but it's not time. And so Jesus escapes out of their hand, goes again by, beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing at first, and there he stayed. And this is why I told you I'm kind of excited about Friday night. I kind of think this is what got me going on this because I see Jesus go back to the place where he's baptized. There's a familiarity here. There's the, you, go, you keep rushing back to that moment where a dove comes out of heaven, sets on your shoulder and goes, this is my beloved son whom I am well pleased. Wouldn't you go back there when times get tough? People are about to stone you to death. You go, where should I go? You know, in the movie, the guy goes to his home where he grew up or he, you know, he goes and sets in his church and, or whatever, some, mo some place. And John plays this, this almost out like a movie. They pick up rocks to kill and Jesus escapes. Life's getting tough. Jesus goes back to that starting blocks and rests in that place, that place where he had his identity. He went away again beyond the Jordan to the place where John was baptizing, and there he stayed, 41, 42. Then many came to him and said, John performed no sign, but all the things that John spoke about this man were true, and many believed in him there. Last screen. I just thought about this, and... I thought this was a good place to end. Maybe Jesus goes back to a place of great success after such a contentious trip because in his humanity, he wanted to be celebrated. That's not vain, that's human. And even sons of God want to feel accepted. It's not a bad thing to go where you're, to go where you're celebrated, to go where you're comforted. It doesn't make you weak. And if it is, if it does, then it's the kind of weakness God put in you for a reason. Because there is a part of you that is codependent, particularly on your family. And it's supposed to be that way. And it's because God didn't make us an island. That's the whole point of the Adam and the Eve and the Cain and the Abel. There's more people in the story than just one guy. Because God wants you to realize that that's the important part of humanity. I see Jesus going back to that starting block. Because even Jesus, and I've, I've really tried to do this with you guys more and more. I've tried to emphasize the humanity of Jesus, but not at the expense of the divinity. Not to take away that he's divine and that he's God, but to, get, but to really emphasize his humanity. Because in emphasizing his humanity, you get to see yourself. You don't really see yourself in the whole divinity side. <laughs> well, we want to, but we don't. But we do see ourselves in the part that hurts and gets wronged and gets betrayed and sees pain and loss. You feel it when Jesus finds out his cousin, John the Baptist, got his head cut off. And the one person in ministry that understands him is dead. You feel that. You feel it when Judas kisses him on the cheek and betrays him. You feel it when Peter curses his name and denies him. You feel it, why? Because that's human stuff. You don't feel it when he walks on the water. You don't know what that's all about. I mean, you, know, you, you get in awe, but you don't feel it. You feel this. Guy goes back to the place where he started his ministry because people wanted to kill him. So that's okay. Lean into that humanity. Rest in it. It's all right. Part of that, you are God's. You belong to him. You're part of who he is. I hope we've taken some of the sting out of what is often an over... A lot of people just jump right past that passage in John 10. You don't hear a lot of teaching on Jesus saying you are God's because we don't really know what to do with it. Like, what does he mean? But he's really di digging deep into a theme of the Bible to go, there's a part of you that's just like God. And, you, and it's time to start realizing it. And the new covenant allows you to take it to the next level. He goes, I'm just like him. I'm, I'm, his, I'm one of his. And I have the authority to call myself that. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for tonight. And I thank you for what you've said. And I pray that we've done it justice and said it the way you would, that, that would bring glory to your name. We have lifted you up. I've tried to shine the spotlight on Jesus so that, so that you are given the glory that you deserve. And wherever we failed in that, then I ask that you help us to treat those words like thorny ground, just where the seed doesn't take root. But in the places where you've been magnified, lifted up, then I pray that it take root in our hearts that we realize that we have something very special, that we're the sons and daughters of God, not just mentally assenting to that, but letting that soak deep out, down into our hearts. And then we can see what happens as we start to come into that realization. Thank you for that. We have 
simply thrown seed and water. Now you give increase in Jesus' name. Amen.